Well, I've always had a real warm spot in my heart for for CSU, and I guess that's why I've always enjoyed working there and thought that it was such a great institution and the programs that I were working with were unique and really made a contribution to the state and the nation. I, uh, I first became acquainted with uh, CSU when I was in high school. So I, I got to go to some football games and then I participated in some competitive activities through the vocational organization on campus. Uh, and from that early time, I always thought that CSU, and at that time, Colorado A&M, was the greatest institution in the world. And if I ever went to college, that would definitely be a place that I would go. And then after graduating uh, from CSU, I uh, worked closely with the faculty at CSU and as a supervisor of student teaching and projects and working on a master's degree. And, then kind of made a goal that if I was going to stay in education, my ultimate goal would be to get into a university setting. And so when I got the opportunity to join the faculty, I thought that was probably the best day in the world for me. And as it turned out, it was. And uh, I, uh, I continue to feel that the programs that we have at CSU serve a unique need in we're the only institution in Colorado that prepares vocational teachers, and it's a joy to me to see that the the programs have, have grown and thrived, and uh, I'm proud that I felt that I had somewhat of a part in developing those programs. Paul Gray was a very important person in my life. Outside of my parents, he definitely had more influence on me than any other person in my entire career. Uh, I first came across Paul Gray. He was my high school vocational ag teacher for three years, and I was a very shy farm boy who was afraid to even meet people, and working with him and the student organization, he got me involved in public speaking, parliamentary procedure contests, and through his dedication and work and really kind of taking me under his wing, I uh, got to participate on a state and national level in competitive contests and gained a lot more courage and ability to, to meet people. And fortunately for me, well, unfortunately, he left the high school and when I was a senior. Uh, but when I was a sophomore at CSU, he joined the faculty and from early on, he, unbeknownst to me, he had made a little pact with my mother. My mother said, someone in this family should and needs to graduate from college. My mother was enrolled at then Colorado Agricultural College, and she dropped out of the institution to get married, and she always felt that she would like someone from this family to go to college. And, I didn't know this, but in high school she had talked to Paul Gray and they'd made a pact and Paul Gray assured her that I would be the one <laughs> that would go to college. So I had constant encouragement and he said, there's no question you're going to do this and do that. Even after I got to college, I wasn't majoring in a teacher education program and he kept saying, you know, you would be a good teacher, this would be a good career for you, and I said no. Finally, he convinced me of the advantages of this, and, and I agreed to change my major to that under one condition that he would be my high school or my college advisor, which he was. And again, that was another thing that really worked out well for me because I enjoyed the teacher education aspect. And even <clears throat> during my latter years in college, Edna May Gray, his wife, was appointed the dorm mother of Newsom Hall, which was just opening when I was a junior at college. And she approached me and asked if I would apply for a position. At that time, we called them counselors. Today, we call them resident assistants. And I received that job. And so Paul and Edna Mae Gray lived in Newsom Hall and were the dorm mothers. And uh, so I not only got to see Paul Gray during the day as my advisor, but Edna May, in so many terms, was my boss because I worked for her at Newsom Hall. My senior year, I was appointed head counselor 
of Newsom Hall and she remained in that position for two more years and then Paul took a job in the U.S. Office of Education in Washington, D.C. And I continued to have a professional and a personal relationship with him then. He spent 20 years in Washington, D.C., got me involved in many national projects, and we continued to correspond and see each other at least three to four times a year. And uh, even after his retirement, we maintained a very close personal relationship. So he definitely has a place in my heart for getting me into this career, which I'm very happy that I did. I was a student. Well, I graduated from Colorado State University in 1957. I enrolled in Colorado A&M. And I was the only class that had a choice of which institution they would graduate from because they changed the name from Colorado and AM College to Colorado State University during my senior year. And the governing board said, you can determine whichever name you want on your diploma. And some of the diehard Aggies definitely wanted to graduate from A&M. And I thought, well, if, if this is going to be Colorado State University, I want that on my diploma. So I did graduate from Colorado State University, and that was in 1957. I received my uh, master's degree in 1963. I continued to work on my master's degree. I, I got a job teaching, but I, I had a month vacation. So I spent my entire vacation for six years going to school in the summertime, and I completed my master's degree at, at, after six years after my bachelor's degree. You were dedicated. And so, and when did you start as an employee at CSU? I got my first opportunity to join the faculty in 1963 when I was approached and wondered if I would take a one year temporary appointment because one of the faculty members was granted a sabbatical leave and they asked if I would then take his place. Uh, I was married then, and Joyce and I discussed that and we said, you know, it's not a long-term deal, but it will really give me an opportunity to see if I like the university work. And at the same time, I at that time had a goal to get a, a doctorate, and it would be a normal step beyond that. So I spent a year, thoroughly enjoyed working in the teacher education department and vocational department at CSU. And after that year, it gave me an opportunity to apply for various assistantships, and I wasn't granted a uh, instructorship at, at Ohio State University, so I got to go there and complete my PhD. And uh, after my uh, PhD, there were no openings at CSU or any institution, and I was kind of saying, well, I, I'm going to have to stay in the West. Uh, but I did get a job, fortunately, working for the State Board for Community Colleges and Occupational Education as assistant to the state director in Denver. And with the understanding that if a job ever opened up at CSU, I would apply for it. And he made an agreement. He said, I will not only let you apply for it, I will help you get it. So that worked out real for me. So I spent a year in Denver and then a, a job opened up at CSU and I applied and got it. Perfect. Well, I've always thought that voc ed programs were important, basically how they affected my life. You know, if it wouldn't have been for my vocational program in high school, I'm pretty sure I never would have been able to go to college or had any desire to go to college and don't even know if I'd finished high school. But it provided a program that I was interested in and so I'm, I'm biased about the need and value of vocational program. And I think that my um, justification really goes back because vocational programs were the first programs that were really subsidized by the federal government. Clear back in 1917, they started providing money for vocational programs. And as a part of that provision, if we're going to expand vocational programs at the secondary or post-secondary level, we're going to need teachers. So there was money in that particular federal act to designate an institution that would provide for teacher education. And CSU, and that time Colorado State Agricultural College, was the logical choice because the programs primarily at that time were aimed at agriculture, 
home economics and all of the trade and industrial type occupations. And so those were all prevalent at CSU. So in 1918, CSU at that time, Colorado Agricultural College was designated for training vocational teachers. And we've had what I think a strong program ever since then. And uh, I think continues to be. When, when I was department head, our program in vocational education was rated in one of the top five in the nation. And we continue today to see our programs in the vocational, occupational, post-secondary level rated in the, rated in the top 10. Can you talk a little bit about your transition from faculty to department head, or were there any special initiatives that you were particularly proud of? Well, I really enjoyed the faculty role, and uh, we had gone through a search for a new department head, and after a year, uh, we had not been able to find someone. And we, the majority of the faculty were attending, as I recall now, a convention in Chicago. And out at one evening socializing, we started talking and a number of faculty said, you know, we think that somebody that has the experience already at CSU would make a, a good administrator. And I was still relatively young. And some of the faculty said, would you be interested in doing that? And I had never thought about that and after some discussion and, and encouragement from some of the senior faculty members and uh, I decided that I would apply for the job as department head and received that job spent 10 years in that particular position and of course again that was an ex excellent experience for me being able to work in that particular capacity. And I'm proud to say that during that time, uh, our faculty more than doubled in terms of the number of full-time faculty we had. And it was probably the glory years of vocational education in terms of tremendous tr uh, support from the federal government and the state government. So we had a lot of opportunities to gain research dollars and, and additional dollars to expand our programs. I think I learned early on that you need to listen to what faculty members are saying, that you need to provide some guidance and direction, but if you listen to the faculty and give them enough authority and space to work, a lot of better outcomes uh, rather than, uh, in, in my entire career I've worked for a number of administrators, some of them very autocratic in their methodology and others not. and. Uh, some of the most autocratic I thought were very effective, but they were only effective for a certain part of the, uh, the people they worked with. The others, it didn't really provide an incentive for them to do many things. So I think listening was very important, getting the faculty involved and then spending time to try to provide environment for their faculty and the related students a chance to succeed. Yes, the, Duane, a, a number of the people who later became uh, members of the faculty I was directly involved with in students. Uh, Duane and Rich Feller come to mind uh, were all persons who were exposed to CSU because we had what they call the Educational Professional Development Act that CSU was one of the 11 institutions in the United States that received funding from the federal government to provide specific fellowships for students to work on advanced degrees. Uh, I'm proud to say that during that tenure of that particular act, more people chose CSU than any other institution in the United States. Each state was allocated resources to provide these fellowships for their students and then the students could choose any one of the 11 institutions to go to and it was not uncommon that we would have 20 doctoral students on full fellowships through this particular act. Rich Feller was one and Dwayne Jansen was one and I'm happy to say that I was smart enough at that time after they completed the degree and gone away and got experience, when we had an opening in our unit, 
I asked them to come back and apply and hired both uh, Rich and Duane to the faculty uh, when I was department head. And of course they've been very successful and the department has definitely gained from their knowledge and what they did for it. Well, it's a family thing now, you know, we, we go to football games and it, as I said earlier, I, we're a CSU family because I've been involved with it since I was in high school and always been involved directly in some way with the institution over 50 years as a student, undergraduate, as a graduate student, as a faculty member, as an emeritus faculty member in alumni associations. Both of my sons graduated from CSU. One of them is now an administrator at CSU. So uh, we're definitely a CSU family. In other words, many people accuse, uh, accuse our family of bleeding green and gold, but uh, we're definitely a CSU family and have a warm, part, warm spot in our heart for the many things that it's enabled me and my family to do. Well, it's definitely a give and take situation. I, I think I and my family have got much more from CSU than we have given back. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm happy that <clears throat> My, my son has felt that CSU has provided him an opportunity to become very successful in his career and he's given back in many, many ways now as an administrator, but prior to that through providing a lot of resources for various programs on the campus. And we, we definitely feel that we need to continue to give back to the institution because, you know, it was without the opportunities that I had at CSU, you know, we wouldn't be where we are today. So it's kind of a win-win situation. If we can give back, which we hopefully we will continue to do, it would be good for us and hopefully the institution. Uh, I, uh, I, in my tenure at CSU, saw a lot of changes, you know, particularly if, from when I was a student because I, I can tell you many stories about when I was a counselor at Newsom Hall, we had to walk across the pig farm to get to the central part of the campus and, and the dairy farm was where the student center is today. So uh, the campus itself has changed tremendously. As, as the institution has grown, the organizational structure has changed. I, uh, I was involved in, in a lot of those changes. Uh, one particularly, and I, I, I'm proud of this, is that in one of our organizational structures, uh, they were asking, shouldn't we combine the then units of vocational education and education? I was on that particular committee that said we would recommend this with certain caveats. And, and one is that I could get the faculty in vocational education to agree to combining it, first of all, uh, if we would call it a, a unit in occupational and educational studies. And secondly, I said, since we're combining two very important and rather large departments, I came up with the suggestion that we ought to call it a school. And so the committee said that's a good idea. So our proposal to the university was, that if we combine the two units, it will be called the School of Occupational and Educational Studies. And a school was a unique organizational structure at that time. There were no schools on campus, and of course there are other schools now, but then later as programs changed, we changed the name to, which is more common with many other land-grant institutions that having a school of education or a college of education. Well, if you look at, at one of the roles of, of an administrator or a head or whatever the organizational structure is, I think that's one of your primary roles is that you have to look out for the welfare of the entire unit, not only the individual faculties, but the programs and, that the students have. And if you do anything, that's your number one priority. And of course, that's related to, to budget issues. And, and one of the things that I learned early on in my tenure as a department head that 
the university is a political animal. You know, politics play every day, and when you're in an administrative position, you have to realize what the politics are and try to make the decisions that are best for the overall best of your unit. And if the administrator does that and spends time on that, it frees up the faculty so that they can do their real job of teaching, research, and service. When we did restructure and become a school, uh, we appointed two assistant directors. One, Lonnie Wood was appointed the, dire the assistant director in charge of undergraduate programs, and I was assistant director in charge of graduate programs. And I held that position of the, of the director of graduate programs until I retired. And again, I, I always had an interest in the graduate programs because soon after I joined the faculty, way back in 1966 for my second term, uh, we were making a proposal to start a new doctoral degree. And it wasn't easy to get a new degree at that time. And I was involved in the steps to get that. And then as the degree grew and flourished uh, in my position as director of graduate programs, I, I'm proud to say that I was the one that got the program in the specialization in teacher education started and working with the presidents of the Colorado Community Colleges, I got the specialization started in our unit in community college administration and that those programs have grown and flourished and become very popular now and so I guess I'm proud of that that uh, it was it was not easy particularly in the community college area because there was some concern on the part of the community college presidents that the program in Colorado to train community college administrators ought to be lo located at the University of Colorado. In fact, there was a program called the, uh, under a Kellogg grant where they were training uh, community college administrators at University of Colorado. And uh, after the money from Kellogg dried up, the university decided that they would not maintain that program, so that gave me an opportunity to go to the, the college presidents and say, would you support a program if we started one at uh, CSU? And it took some convincing, but uh, after a while we got it started, and, uh, and today I think it's a very successful specialization. I feel very, very lucky that I got the opportunity to join the faculty at CSU, you know. As I talk to my wife and people many, many times, I say, if I had to choose my career over again and had my choice, I probably wouldn't make any changes. I would definitely be a high school teacher where I taught because that's where I found my wife. <laughs> and we've been married over 50 years and that was probably the best thing that ever happened to me. And the opportunity to join CSU, and then now in my retirement years, it, it's, it feels good to go back and say, well, you were a part of this great institution, and maybe in a very, very small way, had some part in the success it's had in many areas. And I look at the success that the unit has, you know, in many, many ways. And then I come back and say that, you know, I, I feel really happy that I achieved some amount of success in terms of awards for teaching or research. And, and probably I'm most proud of the fact that during my tenure at CSU, I served as the national president for three different honorary or professional societies. And so as I look back, uh, you can look at my den in here, uh, a number of the things are uh, indicating my service to those particular organizations, which is, as you go back in your older years, that gives you some solace that the, uh, it was nice that I had that opportunity. Well, it, I hope it made a difference in the profession, you know, yeah. I know it, it it made a difference in me because it enabled me to grow and, and see and experience many things that without the opportunities in the various professional organizations that I was involved with, 
uh, I wouldn't have had near the experience that I did and probably been able to do some of the things that I did as a faculty member or an administrator.